I'm here at the Investigations Division of the United States Department of Justice, where a criminal investigation is currently underway into the interest rate fixing scandal that has rocked the financial industry. It's one of many legal fronts open against the 16 banks responsible for setting the London Interbank Offered Rate, or LIBOR, to which hundreds of trillions of dollars in loans, and even more in derivatives, tie their interest rates. In the UK, Barclays Bank was fined $450 million after an investigation by the Financial Services Authority found that its bankers had submitted false estimates to the British Banking Association of the interest rates at which it borrowed from other banks. It did so, presumably in concert with other major banks, in order to inflate the profits of the bank's derivatives traders. The British Banking Association is the non-governmental trade association responsible for setting LIBOR each day and its members began rushing to the aid of investigators before the public was even made aware of the investigation, seeking to cooperate in exchange for immunity and prosecutorial leniency. The Swiss banking giant UBS has already reached a conditional immunity agreement with the DOJ on one branch of the investigation, and the fine Barclays paid out to regulators was part of its partial immunity deal reached with criminal investigators in the U.S. and U.K. Documents made public by Canadian regulators suggest that Citibank has also sought to provide information on the rate fixing to lighten its own share of the criminal burden. Still, all 16 of the banks involved in setting LIBOR remain under federal investigation in the U.S. and abroad, and all are targets in a class action suit brought by the city of Baltimore. The plaintiffs allege that the conspiracy to suppress the LIBOR rate lowered the value of LIBOR-backed derivatives on their books. This exacerbated the effects of the financial crisis of 2008 and forced deep budget cuts across the public sector and a growing group of state attorneys general are putting together a similar class action suit of their own. To shed light on the details of the case and its broader implications, The Real News spoke with Professor of Law and Economics and white-collar criminologist Bill Black. As Black explains, now that evidence has emerged that there was a conspiracy to rig LIBOR, the case against banks can be brought outside the financial regulatory bodies and into civil and even criminal courtrooms for violations of federal antitrust statutes. In terms of antitrust, this is really a cartel that is setting price. Now, supposedly it wasn't setting price. The theory was it was simply reporting. This is what we were borrowing at. And what's come out in the investigation is that wasn't true. That what they were reporting was not simply what was happening. That instead they chose to report prices that didn't reflect reality, but which would help the banks, and in some cases would help other people who the banks chose to favor. And there's one infamous email about helping another trader at a rival firm. It didn't even look like the person knew that person very well, and they were happy to gimmick the rate for them. So uh, a complete lack of integrity. Well, if you have a cartel and it fixes price, and in particular if it manipulates price for the benefit of the cartel, well, that should be a per se violation of the antitrust laws. And what that means is we don't have to establish it's bad or good. A per se violation is considered by the law to be a demonstration that it's a harmful conspiracy against the public. So then it's a question of, did they in fact do it, and were we hurt by it, and how much were we hurt by it in terms of the damages. Similarly, lots of people were hurt in their capacity as homeowners, because their borrowing was off of a LIBOR-based index. And this is, just means an adjustable rate mortgage that was tied to LIBOR. Well, if they manipulated LIBOR up, and there were many, many times in which they manipulated it up, then you could get locked in for 30 years of paying an excessive interest rate. Uh, and so that's not this suit, but that's the broader kind of suit that the American people, uh, and not just American, literally, it's going to be in the tens of millions of homeowners that were hurt by this. And the amount of money these suits could cost banks could dwarf the $450 million settlement reached between British regulators and Barclays. Everybody that's in a bad position as a result of the manipulation of LIBOR has a claim 
that there was fraud in the inducement of the contract. And if it's fraud in the inducement of the contract, if the bank that sold the swap was one of the entities that was also manipulating LIBOR, and there's a significant chance that's true, although it's a harder factual case uh, and will require more investigation. But if those things are true, then the normal rule is I get to void that contract if I wish. And the key thing is you get to sue an antitrust potentially, you get treble damages under the antitrust laws, three times damages, uh, if you're able to establish this cartel theory that I've been talking about. Uh, and for civil fraud, you get punitive damages, right? And you get potentially to go to a jury on the damages. And the juries may be in a very bad mood about the largest banks. Uh, cheating people in, in this world. So this is something that has potential existential risk to a number of the largest banks in the world. But whether or not the hundreds of municipalities and government agencies that lost money from LIBOR fixing will reclaim taxpayer losses remains unclear. Given the frequent conflicts of interest between elected officials and financial institutions, it may well take popular action to force investigators to reclaim public losses, as political scientist Tom Ferguson explains. The, the transparency here in the states and cities is, I think, not at all what it should be. And it's troublesome when you look at things like the, um, let's see, the Association of Democratic Attorneys Generals, and the Association of Republican Attorneys General. These are effectively 527 political organizations. As far as I can tell, they're almost, they're almost never discussed or written about, but what they do is businesses with an interest kick into these things, and then the money goes into attorneys general campaigns. Uh, I mean, this is sort of backdoor campaign cash. Um, and then there's the front door cash. I mean, state treasurers and other uh, have to run for office. You know, they, there's no question. Every time you look at their uh, campaign finances, you, you see folks doing business with states. Now, and when you see big behavioral differences, like the way the aggressiveness of some of the private sector folks in trying to get the losses repaid, I mean, to take the contracts back and make people buy them back, this doesn't happen in the public sector. I think we have a real problem here. I think it's a classic money in politics one. Um, it is undoubtedly different in each state depending exactly on the state rules. But the boy, if there's one generalization that works uh, in this country about money in politics is that when you get to state politics, most state political rules on this are really pretty weak. Meanwhile, the class action suit filed by the city of Baltimore progresses, and across the country, the Oakland City Council has demanded the immediate termination of its swap agreement with Goldman Sachs. More and more, people look into their city's finances and take matters into their own hands, as they're asked to bear an increasing share of the cost of financial crime. For The Real News, I'm Noah Gimbel in Washington.